this week, I was having such a fun time with this message, getting it ready. And I was talking to Tom about it, because I just told him some of my topics, okay, I'm going to be talking about this this week. And so I went to the doctors, I had some uh, tests to go over, and um, nothing life threatening, I just wanted to let you know I'm okay. <laughs> but I picked up this book out of my reading arsenal. It's a wonderful life study guide. Have you ever heard of that? The wonderful life study guide goes through the whole movie and it describes different things of the movie parts and uh, and, gives, and it's like a study guide on, you know, uh, valuing the insignificant or um, anger leads to bad decisions. I mean, it just, it's a really cool little study guide. So uh, when I was getting ready uh, with Tom in the car and I just had this book and I opened it up, just opened it, I, why would I pick up this book of all books? I opened it up and I go, that's the scripture I'm referencing today. And it's about um, Zacchaeus. Of all people in the world, I'm talking about Zacchaeus today, and that's what it was referenced in here. I said, okay, God, I, don't, I ain't looking for a sign, but you sure gave me one that this was the right message for today. And it starts in Luke. We want to take a look at Luke 19, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 10, and that's basically my passage for today, Luke 19, 1 through 10. The message is entitled, True Conversion. True Conversion. We're going to talk about the conversion of Zacchaeus, what it looked like. So let's take a look at 19, Luke 19, 1 through 10. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was a little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today, now, <laughs> I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. You know, I have to stop here just for a second. Bush mentioned this. When he called, uh, when Jesus called the um, fishermen, they didn't him haw and, and say, I got to go do stuff. They came immediately, and he said the same thing. He came down hastefully with joy. I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, and then when they saw it, here's it. And when they, do we have a bunch of they's in our life? When they saw it, they all murmured, mm -hmm. saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have taken anything from any man by false accusation. I restore him fourfold. Jesus said to him, This day, today, is salvation come to your house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just break that scripture down with you and go through a couple of things. He first says he's the chief among everybody. He's the chief publican. What did Paul say in 1 Timothy 1.15? Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So Paul knew he was a sinner and he knew he needed Jesus. And same thing with Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus, in Matthew, it talks about uh, the rich man uh, in Matthew, but Zacchaeus was also rich. What does it say about rich people in the Bible? Matthew 19, 23 through 24 says, But when the rich man heard that saying, by the way, this is a rich man that was a young rich man. He had a lot of stuff. He was young, and he said, Lord, what can I do to be saved? What do I need to do? And, and he started telling him, I need to love the Lord and keep this and keep that and do that. And Jesus said, you are right on, but there's one thing you lack. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. And he walked away sadly because he had much goods. What was the difference between that rich man and the rich of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus gave away his goods. But the little young rich man kept it because he was sad he had too much. And it says right here, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say to you, that a rich man can hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, there's a lot of rich pastors in the world today. Tom and I were talking about it, and we do talk about the messages, and one thing we brought up was Christians are givers, and we give, and then there's those that just ask and ask and ask, and I guarantee you those are the rich ones. I'm just leaving it there for you. Okay, so then Zacchaeus was also short, and he was small in stature. How many people think that you just don't have enough? You don't have what it takes to just... Just too small. Well, what about the small fishes that fed thousands of people in John 6, 9? What about Psalm 119, 141? It says, I am small and despised, David said. And then it says in Job 8, 7, do not despise small beginnings. You know, I don't know about you, but when I see a penny on the ground, I pick it up. <laughs> because one penny leads to a million dollars. I don't just overlook a penny. A penny means a lot to me. I do not despise that small thing. What else did he do? He got up in a tree. Now, how many of you, uh, think about it. Think, if you think about it, he was well-known, he was rich, um, and he climbed a tree. Uh, I think he embarrassed himself. I think he embarrassed himself for Jesus. He wanted to get close to the Lord and did whatever he needed to do to see him, and he climbed a tree. What leader that you know would climb a tree? He was rich and famous, and he made a fool of himself for Christ. What are we willing to do? Are we able to stop and talk to a homeless person? Are we worrying about what other people might see? In this little book that I was telling you about, I grabbed a hold of something. It was really good, it said, some, it's going to cost you because valuing others involves sacrifice. So he sacrificed his integrity, his reputation to see Jesus, to do something with Jesus. Jesus called him to spend time with him at his house, a little time with him at his house. He visited him. Romans 9.24 says, he has called us. So he was calling Zacchaeus, and he also calls us. Galatians 5.13 says, he has called us to liberty. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling. And then 1 Peter 5.10 says, he has called us into his eternal glory. So he calls us to, just like he called Zacchaeus. We could be climbing in a tree, we can be in a bar, we can be in, working in the yard. But he's going to call us. And are we going to just say, uh, excuse me, Lord, I'm just going to wait until next week to get back to you. Or are we going to go now? Today is that day of salvation. Well, when Zacchaeus was called, he was excited and happy about it. When I was called, and I'm pretty sure as you as believers who receive Christ, you're like, wow, I am so happy you saved me. Now, yeah. if that's the right attitude to have. Um, some other people say, now what do I have to do? I don't know how many people have said that. Now, what if, what's we're going to be required of me? And I love our Bible study. We should say, here am I. And in later chapters, you'll say, you'll see, send me. So here am I, send me. He was happy. Psalm 98, 4 says, with trumpets and the sound of a cornet, make a joyful noise to the Lord, the king. He may not have sung Zacchaeus, but he spoke clearly to those who were listening. Psalm 35, 9 says, And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in thy salvation. So he talks a lot about joy, being joyful and happy. See, Zacchaeus gave up worldly things for Jesus. And he knew that by giving up things, he would gain more. Somehow he knew something was happening. But here's what happened. So the people saw him climb a tree, and they, all those they's out there, began to murmur because Jesus went to be a guest with a sinner. What's the difference between murmur, murmur and a complaint? 
The murmur is a soft and distinct sound kind of made mumbling under your breath about something. But a complaint, we have a suggestion box in there. If you got a complaint, stick it in that suggestion box. We can do something about it. But a murmur you can't do nothing about. But we can do something about a complaint. The Grecian widow in Acts 6, 1 through 5 had a complaint. They were being neglected in the daily ministration. It was okay for them to complain, but not to murmur. Difference. Luke 15, 2, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And then Zacchaeus stood up and said in front of all the naysayers, he said this, he said, I'm saying this, I will give half of my goods to the poor, and, and if I've taken anything from any man through deceit, I will give him back four times what I took. Do you believe Zacchaeus was converted at that moment? I believe between the time he came out of the tree, matter of fact, before that, because he had to know who Jesus was to want to see him, so God was already working in his heart for salvation. And when Jesus says, today is your day of salvation, it just kind of connected the dots. We were talking about that in Bible study today, about Moses and how the dots connected and how he was called 40, 50 years later to come back and free the people. I think he was truly converted because he acted upon it. How many people say, yeah, I received Christ as my Savior, but then they continue living the way they did? That, to me, is not a true converted life. Your actions speak louder than your words. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. The evidence of receiving Jesus is, I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm a sinner. I need help. And then at that point, you start telling people. I remember when I was uh, accepted Christ as my Savior, March 6, 1977. I was 21 years old. Matter of fact, interestingly enough, a few years before that, I had a fake ID so I could go into bars. The minute I turned 21 and legal, I get saved. <laughs> and I never went back again. I knew I was saved. I wasn't drawn into those situations anymore. Something changed in my heart. I went home and I told my mom, guess what I did today, mom? I received Jesus as my savior. She goes, you did what? And I had owed her over $3,000 and in 1977, that's a lot of money. And she said, I erase your debt. She saw I was truly converted and forgave me of my debt. So they saw the evidence, and because they, all my sisters, uncles, aunts, and nephews, and nieces, saw that I had changed, they go, we want that too. If Linda can change, we can change. And one by one, within a year or two, everyone went to that same little church, received Christ as their Savior, was water baptized. My aunts, my uncles, my nephews, and my nieces, and my parents all in that same little church because they saw that I truly converted. They knew how I was before. It was like night and day. So you know when you've been converted. You know in your heart that your life has changed. That's the evidence. Not only this, but Zacchaeus was the seed of Abraham. Wasn't a promise given to Abraham that him and his seed we see salvation. I think that's why he was called. It was like with Moses. He was called back into Egypt where he never wanted to go back again. I like that story that we need, we're going through in Bible study. Jesus said, I have come to seek and save that which is lost. I believe that's our heart in this church. We had... Lucy and Ophemio, man, they went out at four in the morning to hand out muffins and biscuits and gifts and inviting people to church. They went out seeking and saved those who were lost. 
Greg's working with family members in the area on helping them in their housing situation. They were flooded out, and he's helping them with things. He's seeking to save those who are lost and different people in the neighborhood. Becky, she, she sees people walking down the road. Can I join you? <laughs> She's seeking people who may be lost. What are we doing with our lives? Are we really seeking and save, helping to save those who are lost? Now, last week I talked to you about only God can save people, but it's our job to seek them. The Bible says that a wise person seeks and saves and, and goes after those people. That's a wise person. And I think this is a wise church. We're always looking at ways to help others. And I believe you had some family members in your house, but they were Christians, right, that young couple? So they got to enjoy fellowship. So not only do we seek and save those we're lost, we hang out with those that aren't. We hang out with people that we can enjoy and be with. That's our mandate. God still accepts into the kingdom those he chooses. Our friend Russ, he is a hell's angel and had been there for years. And he's done, you know, God only knows what he was doing in his life. But he received Christ and was saved out of his sin. Amen. And I thought that was... A miracle, right? That was a miracle to see Russ receive Christ. So our life as a Christian, we can seek sinners, people. We can, but we can seek them. Mark 16, 14 through 16 says, And he said to them, Go and do all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. We can seek sinners. We can visit them. The Bible talked about that in our Bible study. The Lord visited the Hebrew children in their affliction and pain those 200 years, I believe, in preparation for when they were going to be free. Okay? So, he, what's a visit? Do you hang out? Do you stay? Do you live with them? No. You visit. I like visiting people because I know I can leave when I want. But if I have people visiting me, I don't know when they're going to go. Is that true? So I like visiting people because I know that I'm going to leave shortly. Matthew 25, 36 says, Naked and you clothed me, I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So when you go to visit somebody in prison, do you get inside with them and hang out and live with them? No, you visit. You only, for a moment, be with them, encourage them, help them. You visit them. And we talked about visiting this morning in Bible study. James 1.27 says, pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. So we can visit sinners. We can be their guest. A guest visits. A guest, we have people that come to church as guests. Some stay, like Jim and Myrna. Some don't stay. But we have people that come and go. So a guest means a person whom hospitality is extended. We can visit ungodly as a guest, as Jesus visits Zacchaeus. But here's the most important part of that story. <clears throat> Zacchaeus was converted, and Jesus was then hanging out with him a little more. So if you go into a place and you share the Lord, and you just want to enjoy their fellowship, what happens if they reject what you have to say? Do we continue hanging out with them and just kind of swallow everything they want to say? Or do you part ways? Well, the scripture is very clear. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. If these individuals love talking about the Lord, then by all means, hang out with them. I got some unbelievers that will talk with me about the Lord, and I'll hang out with them, I'll talk with them. See, Jesus hung out with his disciples, those who were his. He did make a way for the lost and visited them, to hopefully see them converted. Isn't that our hope? When you visit people, isn't that your hope that they receive Christ? That is our hope and our joy. But the Bible says if they completely reject what you have to say, they think you're full of nonsense. Matthew 10, 14 says this, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words 
When you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. So a person who rejects the message of Christ follows after another God. It's an idolater following after another God. Ephesians 5 warns us that an adulterer hath no inheritance in the kingdom of God. But if that idolater decides to convert, hallelujah. I want to tell you something that I heard today. It was about the Asbury Revival. Is it called? Asbury, Asbury Revival. It's in Alabama, I believe. Is that a college? <laughs> I, I did some research on it, and I was thinking about, okay, what's all, what's all going on there? There's about 14 or 15 students that started <laughs> praying. But I found out that they were gay and homosexual transgender. Yet, this is what they said. We know that the Bible says that sex outside of marriage is sin and that homosexuality is sin. And we know this. We know this. But I'm still this way. So what's happening here, and I, and I think it's very clear, is they're saying, I'm homosexual, but I'm a Christian. It's like saying... I'm a pedophile, but I'm a Christian. It's like saying, I'm an adulterer, but I'm a Christian. I'm sorry, I think there's a problem here with that. But here's the good news. Here's the great news out of all that. Christ is being preached. Doesn't the Bible say that? It doesn't matter. They can do whatever. Do say what they do. Don't do what they do. Say, you know, they said, but Christ, at the bottom line, is being preached, period, in a story. So there are people coming and being saved and being transformed because Christ is being preached. Doesn't matter who it's coming from at that point. Unfortunately, that's where it's coming from. But there's a lot of Christians that are not gay, homosexual, and transgender that are there as well. So it's up to you to decide. Is this truly a revival of the hearts? Because if it was true revival of the hearts, those people would be converted. Am I, am I in the wrong place? I don't know. I just have to say true conversion puts Christ first. And it's not identifying yourself. It's identifying Christ in us. I just had to throw that out there. You might disagree with me. But the true conversion causes us to walk in truth. That's evidence of salvation. Are you willing to be honest with one another? Truly honest. Have you changed the way you think about the small and insignificant people? Did you have a heart change? Well, Zacchaeus dealt with a lot of stuff when Jesus visited him. It doesn't say, but I do believe he had a little heart-to-heart -heart with Jesus. He forgave, he for confessed, he repented, he was sorry, and his actions spoke louder than his words when he gave half of his wealth, and he was joyful about Jesus being there. He spoke to the naysayers without fear what they're going to think about him, and he gave to others. He was the host to the most, and that was Jesus. So I need to ask you then, your conversion story, when you received Christ as your Savior, did it really impact you? Was there really a true transformation of your life? Now we look back and go, oh, it's been 40 years since I've been saved. What have we been doing for those 40 years? For me, it's been 48 years. And I can look back and look at my first 20 years. I was kicking and screaming. <laughs> I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I was being dragged along. I think, Rebecca, you were talking about the days of our, of our rebellion. You know, I mean, seriously, I was rebellious, but I knew Jesus was the answer. But I didn't know how to grab a hold of him. And then 20 years later, I finally got it. I finally go, okay, after time after time, God was very long-suffering with me to pull me in. Is he long-suffering with you? Are you long-suffering with one another? Well, I'll tell you, Zacchaeus is a great story to read through and glean from because he was the one of true salvation. You know, there's people on the street that will be driving around, and maybe you do the same thing. I'm just saying this as a, as a closing is... We see a need over there. Do we pass by or do we at least pray? Bottom line, bottom line, pray. Or do we just keep driving? Or do we stop and offer help? 
I saw a person with a windshield that was broken. I said, Lord, I'm, I just want to go help him fix his windshield. But you know, a lot of people don't want to accept anything. They're too proud or too um, full of themselves. They won't accept that. But we want to help where we can. And unfortunately, we can't help everybody. And unfortunately, we're not going to help the way that they want us to help. There's a lot of people, even in our church, that needs help. And we're doing what we can to help. And that's our, that's our motto is we are there to love, to draw you into salvation, and to help where we can. Is that, a, is that our church here? I believe that is. I believe we're here to help others, to draw them in, to seek and save those that were lost. So, Lord, we thank you, Father, for this message, this message of that wonderful life you've given to us, to be able to be filled with your presence and your power, to be able to see the needs of people, to see uh, what is required of us. Here I am, send me. Lord, we have to not be sheepish on that. We have to be bold and courageous when we say that. Lord, use me. And that's basically what we're saying here in this church, God. We're asking, Lord, let this church be a, a church that says, use me. Here we are. Use us. We're to seek and, and those that are lost. We are to compel those to come. God, that is what we want to do, and that's our desire of our heart, Father. I pray that you would speak to every heart here who is struggling in this area of their own heart, their own conversion. And, Father, I ask you to minister to their lives and let them know how much you love them and that you draw them by your spirit, too. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.